Welcome to the Garrulous Gavel. I'm John Tico. My guest in this episode is Bob Eager. Bob was a history scholar who transitioned to law, became a partner at one of the world's largest law firms, and when he retired from that, returned to his roots and started a new organization called Own Your History, which develops curricula and other teaching materials, primarily directed at high school students with the goal of achieving a more just and equitable society. We'll be getting garrulous with Bob about his own personal history growing up in the segregated South and about his motivation for starting Own Your History. We will ask Bob some big questions about why we even teach history to kids and what we hope to accomplish by telling them stories about the past. I found this conversation very interesting. I hope you do too. Welcome to the Garrulous Gavel, and I am here today with Robert Eager, who is the founder and the president of an organization called Own Your History uh, that we'll be learning about uh, today on the podcast. And uh, Robert generally is known by the name Bob. He goes by Bob, and uh, we're all friends here, so I'm going to be calling him Bob today, Bob Eager, which is how I uh, knew uh, Bob, when I first met him, probably about 25 years ago. So we've known each other for a long time. Um, and Own Your History is a very interesting organization that Bob has uh, started that is focused on creating a curriculum for high school students and some after school uh, curriculum as well uh, for sort of middle school and high school age uh, kids that are focused on uh, social justice issues. And so we're going to be talking a lot about history and how that is taught to, uh, to teenagers these days. But before we get into that interesting uh, topic, let's just uh, learn a little bit about Bob. So Bob, tell me where you're from. Where did you grow up? Yeah, I'm actually uh, from Maryland, which is where my mother was from. But then in 1955, uh, we moved to South Georgia, where my father was from. And so I more or less grew up in uh, in South Georgia, and and then I went to boarding school, tenth grade, and then college at Vanderbilt. Um, as I've looked back on that time of growing up, it's particularly working on own your history. Um, it's interesting what you remember that you did wasn't uh, didn't seem significant at the time. Right. And, uh, uh, I mean, one of it is actually was relatively seamless. I mean, it was you know, Jim Crow was very much the law and practice in South Georgia when I was there, but it wasn't that much different than my life in Maryland. Yeah. Um, there were some episodes that were, in retrospect, striking, and I don't know what effect they had on me or not. I mean, for example, um, uh, we, we we lived with my grandmother for six months while our house was being built, and, uh, uh, you know, she was in her 80s and uh, from the South, and... and uh, uh, used the N word as, as a matter of course, uh, and uh, had a black family who lived on uh, her place. She had a, uh, a pecan uh, orchard uh, out in town, and and uh, 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 and while I was I was uh, eight years old and sort of playing out back one afternoon, and the mother of the black family said, "Do you do want to uh, want to come in?" And they had a really a shack. You know, behind my grandmother's house, and uh, so they. I said, "Sure." You know, I, mean, I didn't know him well, but anyhow, she was very nice. And it was late afternoon, but that was her supper time, and there were probably eight family members uh, sitting on a sofa on the floor, and I realized that they were eating with their fingers. Mm -hmm. And the mother said, "You know, you've probably never seen anybody eat with their fingers," and I was sort of dumbfounded and. Sort of, I suppose, mumbled. No, I hadn't. But I realized that they were also that they were eating um, soft food. It was I didn't see any you know, like chicken leg or anything like that. And so this was their their you know their standard diet was sort of grits and collard greens. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I didn't stay very long. But it was just you know, in retrospect, I realized that this was neo slavery. I mean, you know, they were totally dependent on my grandmother, and they lived in a shack that had been, you know, it was you know, one board thick, built in 1912, uh, and uh, it was pretty run down by the 1950s. 
And the and and you said you went to boarding school. Was that also in Georgia? Or? Oh, in, in Tennessee, in, in Chattanooga, then. In Tennessee, uh, and was that it? Was that a segregated I school? Went, I went to segregated schools my entire career, yeah. really. Uh, to even you know, I went to Vanderbilt. Um, it was desegregated my sophomore year in terms of the undergraduate student body. And by the time I graduated, there were maybe 20 black students, so, undergraduates. So what year did you graduate? 60, 1967. So you were there right at sort of the, you know, the beginning or the middle of the civil rights sort of movements of the late 60s. Right. Did you experience that at all when you were in college or was Vanderbilt sort of isolated from it? Uh, it, uh, it was interesting. When I was in high school, uh, in boarding school, I didn't always bet the newspaper, but one May morning in my sophomore year, I bought the newspaper, and on the front of the, of the newspaper was the burning Freedom Rider bus in Addison, Alabama, the day before Mother's Day, uh, 1962. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came out of the dining hall, and a kid from a classmate from Mississippi saw it and uh, uh, made a racist comment about the Freedom Riders. And I hadn't really thought about anything political or civil rights before then, but it struck me in my gut that this guy was wrong. And it was a really, as I look back, it was a kind of a turning point. And I can go back 50 years later and tell you, put an X on the spot on the campus where that happened. Um, and so while I didn't dramatically change my life, I, I felt like I had really rejected inside myself this Southern system that I was growing up in. Uh, so I got to Vanderbilt, and it was a very um, uh, exciting time because it was a new chancellor who was very much uh, wanted to be progressive. Uh, my freshman year, we had a, a program, uh, a, a symposium, and the opening session was two leading Southern newspapermen, you know, the editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch and the uh, Atlanta Journal of Constitution, debating segregation. Mm -hmm. The Atlanta newspaperman was against segregation, and uh, Mr. Kilpatrick from Richmond defended segregation. This is 1963 in Vanderbilt. Uh, uh, I turned out I was the chairman of that program in 1967 when I, when I was a senior. And uh, we uh, were successful in bringing, we had Dr. King, we had Stokely Carmichael, who had just later Kwame Ture, who was the, then the new head of SNCC, who just replaced John Lewis as the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as well as Allen Ginsberg, Senator Strom Thurmond. Uh, and some others, all within 24-hour period at, uh, at at Vanderbilt. But mm -hmm. you know, we had 4,000 people turn out to hear Dr. King and, and Stokely Carmichael, uh, and uh, the, the university was very supportive of our bringing that Tennessee State Senate passed a resolution questioning the university's judgment and in allowing us to invite Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a, uh, a time of uh, controversy, but again, in, you know, in a good way. Right. Uh, right. And uh, you know, after that, I then went to Stanford and Graduate School and really did not was not really engaged in active civil rights activities. Yeah. Uh, so let me let me just so so you graduated uh, college. You said 1967. Right. And what what did you major in in college? I was a history major. Okay. <laughs> and. Um, was your was your interest in history at that point, um, you know, connected in any way to your sort of view of race relations at that time? I mean, not the, the history department was a relatively strong department in Vanderbilt, and people like me tended to become history majors, and so I was not. You know, <laughs> I, 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 people like you, what does that mean? What what, what well, was it about I mean, you? I don't know. I guess that it was you know that they were you know. I, a uh, liberal arts bent rather than a you know, pre-med or, you know, science major. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in retrospect, you know, there's an interesting uh, episode about history. When I was first moved to South Georgia, I was playing with a cousin out in, behind my grandmother's house. Again, I was like eight or nine years old. Uh, and, he, and we had a hammer and nails, and he was hammering something, and he hit his thumb, and he said, John Brown. And... At the time, I didn't really understand why he said John Brown, but I realized it was a swear word, and in my grandmother's house, you certainly wouldn't use, uh, you know, take the Lord's name in vain. Mm -hmm. And so this was his, you know, acceptable way of swearing. I later realized, and later, like 40 years later, realized that it was John Brown, the abolitionist, and that it was an acceptable curse word to, you know, Use John Brown instead of you know uh, some, some other uh, uh, yeah. swear word. 
And it really drove home to me that history has a long tale, you know, that there John Brown died, you know, as it was hanged in, you know, in the 18, late 1850s. And a hundred years later, you know, my 12 year old cousin was using his name uh, as a swear word. Uh, and my uncles did that, and I've since have found a couple of people in other parts of the South that did the same practice. But it was, it was instructive for me to realize that, again, that history can have that kind of a long uh, lifespan, if you will. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And then you, uh, so you went to Stanford for graduate school, also in history? Yes. Yeah, and yes, uh, so, so what was Palo Alto like? Um, from like a ra from like a race relations perspective in the late sixties, it was a white city. You know, I mean, you know, East Palo Alto was the uh, poor area where you know black people lived, and that was at the four, you know, far end of town, away from the camp. And Stanford was on the uh, the west side, and then East Palo Alto was again along the bay. But you know, Stanford was a very white place and segregated. No, not really segregated, but there were, were, they were, you know, uh, black and, and other uh, undergraduates of color, but not not that many. And 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 uh, um, I mean, I, there was one one African American you know, graduate student in history. Out of how many, roughly? Oh, thirty or forty. Yeah. But the but the city of Palo Alto was sort of racially divided. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. A, you know, I mean, even if you went downtown, I mean, I, it was not something you were. I was sort of. Concept, but it was not that much different than, you know, where I, you know, what I would have seen if I went downtown in, in the South. And just in terms of people's sort of attitudes and approach, and like you sort of describe some incidences of sort of this sort of like casual racism in the South, right? Um, did were things any different in California in that regard, or or not really? I, I don't have any strong recollections for either, yeah. e either way. Yeah. Um, and I suspect being white made it, you know, I wouldn't have been as sensitive to that as, as I would have been if I was a person of color. Sure, sure. And so what was your, what was the focus of your studies in graduate I, school, or what did you write your thesis on? Yeah, I, I actually, I wrote my, you know, I, I, I took a fair amount of Southern history. There were two leading historians who, who taught Southern history, and, and uh, they were there, and I studied with them, but my, and by doing my, my dissertation on uh, New York Republican politics in the 1890s, and the emergence of progressivism, particularly uh, uh, through the governorship of Theodore Roosevelt, in 1898, 1899, before he became a rough rider and, and uh, uh, vice president and then president. But uh, um, so it really had nothing, you know, again, it, it was mostly driven by the fact that the Stanford Library had an archive of New York State legislative materials that made it convenient for me to be at Stanford and write a dissertation sure. about, about New York State. Well, that, I mean, that's that's an interesting point and something that I've been thinking about and kind of getting ready to talk to you about this. Well, I was a history undergraduate as well and then went to law school, uh, as you did later, but I, I did not do a, a graduate, graduate program in history. Um, and I really haven't thought about it much since then. But, but in sort of getting ready to talk to you today, one of the things that I started thinking about was this question of sort of how does how does history in the way that it's taught, how does that his history sort of come to be, right? Because there's sort of an infinite number of things that have happened in the past, right. but we somehow go through some process of selecting what are we going to talk about when we talk about the past, right? And, and what you just said is sort of interesting. Like, well, why, why did you write that thesis? Well, because there, there was the materials that were sort of accessible to you. So there was this little slice of history that you could dive into and learn something about, right? And sure. that, that affected that one little piece of history that got written in your dissertation. And I sort of wonder how much of that is sort of baked into the process of developing what we think of as the history of a country. There's sort of what is, what is accessible, what is remembered, what is documented, and those things are not always necessarily the same as what actually happened, right? I mean, I uh, studied you know, American slavery as part of the uh, program, and as I've gotten into the owner history program materials, it's just been striking to me how different the uh, scholarship and study of enslavement is now 
compared to what it was when I was in graduate school, which was, it, was, it, it certainly for me, it, became, it was a kind of an academic uh, subject. Uh, and, and it was, uh, the real nature of the system was not something that was really grabbed us. And now I, you look at what's been the writing and the scholarship for the last 20 years, and it's so much about how the, the entire American economy and system was uh, integrated with slavery. That it wasn't as sort of north and south as really quite different parts of the country. Uh, yeah, and so so that sort of leads to the, the question, and maybe this is sort of a philosophical question about just kind of the nature of history, but what actually happened hasn't changed. I mean, we're talking still about the same period of time and the same series of events, but somehow the way that the story of what happened is told has changed. And so just let's just focus on that one question of, of how slavery is perceived now. Like what, what changed between when you were in graduate school and now that sort of changed how that story is told? I think part of it is they've asked you know, different, deeper, broader, and broader questions. And so the research has, uh, is just uh, uh, richer and deeper. I mean, for example, uh, uh, there's, there's study of the business practices of plantations and how they were uh, both influenced the business practices in the country as a whole, but also were you know, uh, intertwined with uh, uh, you know, the national economy in terms of you know, financing, uh, uh, insurance, uh, you know, where do you buy your, the, you know, the materials you know, you're used on the plantation. Uh, and so that that's, uh, history has been looked into in a way that it, uh, that it, that it, that it wasn't previously. I mean, one of the books that I found most arresting uh, is called by Ed Baptist called The Half uh, Has Not Been Told. And he, his research has shown that the brutality of slavery was directly correlated with growth of productivity. And that the productivity of American cotton production between 1800 and 1860 matched the growth in productivity in cotton uh, weaving production in England that was all mechanized. And the American plantations were just human labor. Mm -hmm. uh, but that the, uh, and if you saw like uh, the uh, 12 Years a Slave movie, where the brutality of the punishment of the, the most productive uh, slave was designed both to get others, uh, other slaves to have to work harder uh, and basically say, just because you're the most productive doesn't mean that you're going to get special treatment. In fact, we're going to mm -hmm. you know, hold you to a, continue to hold you to a higher standard so that you produce more tomorrow mm -hmm. than you did today. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, those were just were questions that just weren't asked when you know when I was in grad school. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we can come back to all that because there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. But just to kind of finish your finish the biography. So after you uh, finished your PhD program, where where did you do next after that? Uh, I went to law school. <laughs> yeah. We look, we were, did you go right from one to the other? We're, we're living here. Yeah. And and I uh, finished my dissertation and and I was looking for jobs and. Uh, we didn't really, I was married, we did, really didn't want to sort of go anywhere in the country. There weren't that many jobs in the late 70s anyhow. Uh, the sort of baby boom hiring and growth of colleges had sort of run its course, and, and uh, so there was uh, not that many uh, new jobs coming open. So, uh, uh, so I went to Georgetown Law School. And, okay. Uh, and when did you graduate from law school? Uh, 1981. And did you go right from there to Gibson Dunn and Crutcher? Where you? I spent another one year with with another firm, okay. uh, and uh, uh, as the Gibson Dunn DC office was beginning to grow, a good friend of mine, college classmate, uh, uh, had come in laterally as a partner, and uh, uh, he suggested I take a look at you know, Gibson Dunn. Who was that? that? Uh, Chuck Lockenfoos. Okay. And, um, and so that was that was sort of mid mid eighties. No, this was mid 80, actually eighty two. I was only 82. it was, it was I, I went there a year after I graduated from 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 law school and was at Gibson. Uh, you know, really my entire career. Okay, and and just because not everybody who's going to be listening to this is a, is a lawyer, they they may not totally understand about 
law firms <laughs> and, and law firm culture and all that. So, so let me, let me just ask a couple of questions that I think I sort of know the answer to, but I'll ask, I'll sure. ask of you anyhow. So when you, when you started, um, at Gibson Dunn and Crutcher, you were in the Washington DC office, right. right? And, and how many lawyers were there at that time? I was the, the, the 22nd lawyer. And, um, and Gibson Dunn was a, a law firm that started out in California, right. and, D, and the D.C. office was sort of a satellite office at that time. So do you remember sort of how big was the Los Angeles office of Gibson Dunn then? The firm as a whole was about 350 or so, uh -huh. and because uh, we had, in addition to downtown L.A., there was Orange County and San Diego. Yeah. Um, I guess Washington was, was, yeah, was the next, next one after, and then Denver uh, but they were they were quite quite small. DC was the sort of the biggest non sort of non California office, right? And sort of the the you know my understanding is that sort of the eighties was the beginning of sort of the expansion of what became these sort of big mega firms that have offices all over the world. And Gibson Dunn is certainly one of those. Um, and sort of expansion and consolidation in the legal business. And yeah, uh, absolutely, no, yeah. and they, Gibson Dunn in many ways was a pioneer. I mean, the managing partner. Uh, then really, you know, had a vision of a national law firm, and and you know, you mentioned we were a branch, and in some respects we were, but the firm philosophy really was that all offices were equal, and we were integrated, and uh, and we did a lot of work across offices. And I worked with, with lawyers in California that I'd never met and didn't wouldn't see until I went to a firm retreat two years later. Yeah, and uh, the firm culture was very much. Uh, uh, collegiality and working, in, uh, you know, across offices and staffing as, you know, find the best person and, and uh, staff that way. And now I assume Gibson probably is over a thousand lawyers around the world. I guess I haven't like kept that. up yet, but yeah. it's, it's uh, uh, it, you know, uh, has expanded internationally. Uh, and um, and what was your specialization? I, I, I worked in financial institutions uh, primarily. Uh, bank regulation and my big my main client base were non banking companies that were trying to get into banking uh, mostly insurance companies but also uh, like Merrill Lynch mm -hmm. uh, so the clients I've mostly worked for were Prudential Merrill Lynch uh, Civic Life John Hancock uh, Travelers and was there any particular reason you ended up in that practice? Um, my friend Chuck was was in that practice, and so you know, it was a natural for me to, to start working working with him. And uh, uh, it was a growth time. There was a lot of legislation and on these matters that was pending in, at that time. As so we got involved in working uh, with the clients on the on, on this legislation, and something which I enjoyed. And my sort of history background had a uh, you know, it, you know some of the connection there that that that, that, was, that worked, and so I probably spent. You know, a third of my time at Gibson Dunn doing, you know, supporting the legislative activities of, uh, of clients. Right. Yeah. And there is there is a lot of history in law. Yeah. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But um, and so you stayed at Gibson Dunn, I think you told me until 2014. Right. right. So you were there. You were there a while, like looking back at that stretch of time so roughly 30 no, was that 30 years yeah, 30, 32 uh, years. you know what what are sort of the key things that stand out to you in terms of how law law firm practice or the law industry changed over that period of time yeah i i, I was really many ways atypical i mean i my practice was a kind of a niche practice that uh uh and, and to, so to that extent i don't know that i really was experiencing sort of what was going on in law firms generally because of the uh, the really small group that I work with, and and uh, um, you know the the, the the one thing I felt particularly fortunate about that really I started from early in my in my career and continued was that um, that I, I had four kids and I, the family was very important and I was really able to arrange my schedule by and large to be uh, present. With my family mm -hmm. on a regular basis, and I was a lesson that when I first came to Gibson Dunn, I had to go overnight to uh, uh, to New York on uh, on, on a matter, and uh, my oldest child, my daughter, was was uh, uh, going on too, and I spent a lot of time with her when she was small, and and so I went away overnight. When I came back, she was playing with a uh, neighbor, and. Um, didn't bat an eyelash, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I realized then that if I wanted to be part of my children's lives, I had to be present. And if I wasn't present, you know, it was my loss. Yeah. And uh, I very felt very fortunate, Gibson, that I was able to really maintain that balance. And partly, I think, because I wasn't a litigator and I wasn't involved in big corporate transactions that had their own sort of, uh, uh, you know, yeah. schedule and and, uh, and 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 demands. I worked hard, but it was but it was right. a, you know I was able to. Uh, that was, manage my schedule in a way that I that I, I appreciated. Yeah, I mean that was certainly that was certainly one of the lessons that I took from my time there was that one of the keys to having a little bit of independence as a lawyer and not just getting kind of ground up by the machine, so to speak, was was to have some real specialized knowledge that other people didn't have, right? Yeah. Because that that both made you valuable to the firm, right? But it also did I, I noticed that the that the lawyers that sort of had these sort of niche specialized practices were often the ones who seemed to be able to control their careers more than, say, the general litigators who kind of had to jump from big case to big case to big case right. and were, you know, maybe more focused on hours um, or, I mean, litigation is hard no matter what you do because <laughs> right. you're always against the deadline. Right. Judges are always, you know, it, but but certainly at the, uh, certainly at the big corporate firms, I mean, there's obviously a lot of hours pressures, but it did seem to me that the people who had sort of a more technical niche practice were somewhat insulated from those pressures. Um, uh, that was not what I was doing when I was there. So it was yeah. a little bit of an outsider's perspective, but it, it seemed that it, way to no, me. In general, that was right. And, yeah. and uh, there were times when things slowed down. And so that was, uh, you know, having a niche practice meant that it was harder to sort of, you know, uh, stayed, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as, as as busy as one was t t uh, typically used to, uh, but it also stood me. Uh, I was fortunate because it, I uh, actually retired as a partner in, in 2008, and uh, was thinking I would be transitioning to something else and winding down my existing practice. And uh, of course, in 2008, uh, the financial world collapsed. And all of a sudden, things that I was very much uh, knowledgeable about became in demand. And so I ended up by being a kind of a contract lawyer working with firm clients, mm -hmm. but not as a member of the partnership anymore, uh, and did that until 2014. And it was a, it was a very interesting time, mostly uh, working for General Electric and uh, uh, GE Capital, which had... Uh, three domestic banks and a couple of foreign banks and, and uh, were really trying to figure out how they were going to do the business and what the right structure would be and how to deal with you know federal regulation and so forth. And so I had a very busy, uh, productive time with them. And it was, you know, it was my highest uh, earning years, and so I can't complain <laughs> about that either. So. All right. Well, good, good, good. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, sometimes other people's misfortunes are, are the, uh, the fortunes of lawyers. It's, it's, uh, it's something about our business. So let's, let's turn a little bit to, uh, to own your history. Sure. Um, and this is really what caught my eye and why I reached out to you to, to do this interview, because I uh, sort of stumbled on the fact that you had started this organization and read a little bit about it and just thought it was just really interesting, um, interesting work that you're doing, but also just interesting that you sort of turned back to history uh, after law. Uh, so let me just start. I want to read this is uh, read a, a couple of sentences that are on the the front page of the website. Um, just just as a quick introduction, and then sure. I'm going to ask you to expound on this. But the front page of your website describes own your history in this way. It says. Own Your History creates inclusive U.S. history curricula, resources, and workshops. We prepare students of all ages and backgrounds to become better informed participants in advancing our nation's unfinished business of achieving a more equitable and just society. Um, and then you also have sort of a mission statement that says that the, the purpose of the organization is to educate, encourage, and empower a new generation committed to achieving the promise of America for all. So it's a, at least as you've described it there on your website, it, it's an organization that that sort of explicitly links history with s sort of preparing young people to do something in the future. Right. So I'll just stop there and let you answer the question: What is own your history? 
So let me st step back a little bit and tell you sort of how, how I, because I didn't, the idea for it did not, uh, I didn't start with the idea. It really was an, it was an evolutionary process in the first year that I was, was working on it. I, I say I stopped being a lawyer at the beginning of 2014, and I was casting about for what was I going to do next. And because uh, I wasn't going to, I didn't, sitting on the front porch was not uh, anything that appealed to me. And, and uh, uh, so my older daughter, uh, who at that point was a graduate student at uh, UVA, said, you know, you're an educator, do something in, you know, you're a teacher, do something in education. And I said, okay, that sounds great, but I don't know, what would I do? And I was reminded uh, of, of two uh, earlier uh, instances. One was that actually I gave my a eulogy for my father. Uh, who died in the in, in, in 2004, and I realized that everything I wanted to talk about in his career happened after he retired. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very active in revamping the food bank. He was uh, helped re rebuild the uh, uh, golf course, uh, started a new program for the United Way, and. As I thought about it, I said, you know, I, I took great heart from that. Because I said, you know, there's life after retirement. Sure. And you can do, you know, great things. And so I said, well, let me, what, what shall I do? And then I was reminded of, uh, I, I, my older son had worked in Berlin in uh, 2010, 2011, and I visited him there. And in the sidewalks of Berlin are these brass cobblestone-sized uh, markers called stumbling stones that uh, commemorate uh uh, people who had lived in Berlin who were sent to the Holocaust. And so it was uh, uh, with their uh, uh, biographical information and the stones were placed at the site of their, of their address. And so you walk down the sidewalks of Berlin and you'll come across a cluster of these stumbling stones and realize that uh, you know, Jewish victims of the Holocaust had lived there and were sent to the Holocaust. And it was, you, you know, you, you couldn't walk past them. That's why they're called stumbling stones. And so after seeing them, I began to think, well, you know, I grew up in the South, and I couldn't remember ever seeing uh, a roadside marker or a historical mark of some sort saying, you know, that a lynching took place here or there was some other civil rights event took place here or something in our mm -hmm. uh, Jim Crow history. And uh, uh, so I was, I was you know, troubled by that, and, and I came back and was... Uh, telling this episode to an in-law who had grown up in the South. He was my, uh, my wife. My brother died uh, all too young, and his wife remarried, and so this was her uh, second husband. Uh, but he'd been, uh, he lived, uh, he went from the South, but he had lived outside of the South his entire career. He was, I think he worked for the CIA. He lived in D.C., worked overseas for an agency that he never would tell us what it was. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was very well read, very well traveled, and, you know, say, was a southerner who lived outside the South. So I'm telling him the story of the of the stumbling stones and my reaction to it. And before I barely got my sentence, last sentence out, he, he said, oh, the South was not like German. And I, I was not expecting that reply. And I realized that um, he was just in denial of our history. Uh, you know, he, he, he clearly was smart enough and well-read enough to, to know what he's, you know, the you know, basics of our history. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, that was his reaction said, to me, boy, we've got a problem. You know, that we're, you know, that we're in denial about, you know, important parts of our past. Mm -hmm. And we can't change it. I mean, the past is a given. You know, we can, we can work on the future, but we can't change anything that happened, has happened in the past. And so it's a, uh, you know, in that sense, it's, it, it's a given. And so that was really what's got me thinking about, well, how do we... Uh, what do we do about that? How do we deal with this uh, denial, which is, which is, you know, in all aspects of our life, denial is a bad thing. I mean, it's usually unhealthy. Right. So let me ask you a question about that. So the, the denial that you're talking about, is that a, something that you perceive as a Southern issue? Because I'll tell you, I grew up in New York, right? And went to school in the 70s and early 80s, basically, public schools in New York. And I think we got sort of a northern version of history where the South was portrayed as a place that was very, very bad for blacks. I mean, there was no, there, there was, we were taught about slavery. We were taught about Jim Crow. I remember even then, uh, 
being taught about some of the economics of the of the sort of colonial period and the Civil War period, and um, maybe the North was in denial about its own complicity, but certainly we were we were not in denial about Southern racism. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if the, the kind of denial you're talking about has regional aspects in the United States. I, I think it does, but I think that the, the fact that, that uh, you know, again, you grew up learning about Jim Crow in the South yeah. when uh, you, know, you were surrounded by, you know, Segregation in various forms, uh, you know, where you live, mm -hmm. reflects, I think, the fact that uh, uh, you know, again, denial is, is functionally you know, varies, but as mm -hmm. has uh, uh, the commonality there. Yeah, For it was example, just sort of the northern version of the you know, Civil the, War. The, the New York Historical Society did a uh, exhibition on slavery in New York uh, in about, about 2010, 12, and. Uh, I visited the, uh, you know, the uh, Historical Society site in, in, in New York, and they had a, a couple of items from that show that they were still they were still on display. And the one that really grabbed me was a was a set of of uh, manacles for a child, and it was you know that size, and you know and the only purpose would have been to uh, put a you know, slave child in manacles, and that was uh, you know from New York. Yeah, uh, and slavery was, uh, you know, uh, was common in New York. Indeed, my I have an ancestor, my uh, five great grandfather, who uh, was a uh, plantation owner on Long Island, and they he called it Northern Plantation, uh, who owned slaves, who had uh, Native Americans who worked for him and, and indentured servants, but but uh, owned a number of slaves. And uh, he was a, a Revolutionary War general, a member of the Continental Congress, signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, was a leading citizen in in, in 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 Long Island. His house is now part of the, the Fire Island National, uh, uh, you know, Sea Shore. Uh, so he's part of the Park Service. Uh, and uh, but he was a slave owner until his, until his death in the 1820s. Uh, and uh, he had more had more in common with uh, the Southerners in. The continental, you know, the continental Congress than he did with some of his, some of his you know, northern men, but a but lot a number of slave owners from from, the, from New York. Right. Yeah. Well, I I grew up on Long Island, not far from there, and that that was not taught to us. Right. It was very much the the North was the non-slave states, the the South was the slave states, and then there was the Civil War. You know that that was kind of the northern version of the of the story, I guess. Yeah, there's a there's a, a family story that I that I'm particularly fond of, and it and it, it's a uh, when he, he went to the last Continental Congress in 1783, uh, he took his his daughter, who then was was 16, Kitty, uh, to find her a husband, and they were staying in a boarding house in Philadelphia with John uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, who were his good friends, and. Jefferson and, the, and my great grandfather decided that she should marry Madison, and so they announced the engagement of Kitty to James Madison, who was in his thirty. He was like thirty-two; she was sixteen, uh, and they had uh, uh, portraits painted by the Charles Wilson Peale of the of the young couple, and it still exists. Uh, uh, she decided she didn't want to marry uh, James Madison, and told her father and Jefferson. And Madison, nope, I'm not going to do it. And in fact, was dating a, uh, a younger guy from from Philadelphia and married him. And what's interesting, in addition to the fact that I've, I when I, I tell that story at my my, my uh, niece's weddings about uh, strong women in our family, yeah. uh, because you think about it, 16 to to blow off a Revolution War general and you know people of the stature of Madison and Jefferson it take, took some uh, 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 courage. But you know, they got mar or she married the guy from Philadelphia, and they moved to South Carolina. And so, again, to me, that reflects the fact, again, that there was not a you know, divide. I mean, that the people moved around. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, another family example of that is my, my the other side of the family, uh, uh, great-grandfather Eager, was from upstate New York, went to, to what is now Colgate College, and 
uh, became a Baptist mis uh, missionary. It was in, uh, uh, in 18, 1840, and he moved to, to Delta, Mississippi, and, and uh, in two years had a, had a church there just outside of Natchez, uh, and became Southern. And uh, his son, my great great grandfather, uh, fought from the Civil War on the, for the Confederate side. And I've again always been struck how again that there didn't seem to be any difficulty in moving from upstate New York to the Mississippi Delta at the time that slavery and the issues surrounding slavery and the expanding slavery were, were very much, you know, hot items politically. Uh, and that he was able to become part of the Southern culture uh, in Mississippi. And you know, again, that whole branch of my family is, is, uh, is very Southern. Yeah. Yeah. So things were more permeable than we think looking back on it. Yeah. Um, all right. So to go back to, to own, own your history. Ah. So you were telling the story yeah. of, of so, how you started, why you started so, this organization. So in, in, in the summer of 2014, I got in touch with and, and ended up by going and spending a couple of days at the University of Mississippi at an organization called the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation, which uh, operated there. And they were running a summer program for high school kids. Uh, and so I went to meet them and observe that. And talking to the director, she called a, 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 a quote to my attention that really became the guiding principle for her own history. And it says, uh, we all benefit from inheritances that we did not choose and cannot change. Growing up involves deciding which part of the inheritance you want to claim for your own and how much you will pay for the rest of it. This is as true for nations as for individuals. And uh, Susan Nyman, who's the director of the Einstein Institute, uh, lives in Germany now, but uh, uh, was from, she's actually from Atlanta. And uh, that's in an essay about uh, uh, dealing with, with the legacy of slavery and comparing, again, how Germany's dealt with the Holocaust and Nazism and Americans and slavery. Uh, but to me, the idea of our history as an inheritance puts it in a different light than it's, it's not that academic subject that you mm -hmm. either liked or didn't like when you were in high school. So what do you mean by inheritance? Or, or, I mean, this is not your words, this is her words, but how do you interpret the word inheritance in that I, context? I, I think that it's everything that comes before, you know, that, 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 you know that, that affects us. And so that, I mean, in my case, inheritance, I mean, again, the stories I've been telling you from my family in terms of uh, uh, people, you know, ancestors who own enslaved people. And... Uh, yeah. uh, you know, if that's part of you know, if part of my inheritance. I'm not responsible for it because I didn't have anything to do with their choices. But it's something that you know comes down to me, and my personal uh, 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 response to that has been to develop on your history to say, okay, let's look at it honestly and thoroughly, and and t use that as a basis for how do we get to a better place going forward. And and you know another example, which is is the uh, the you know the the, uh, the Japanese uh, internment in World War II, which is the one example where the, we as a country have recognized uh, in some degree what happened. But we did uh, the uh, Congress and the president have you know adopted statements of apology and and uh, and and we did provide reparations. Uh, to uh, to Japanese Americans, so in that sense, we own that history nationally, and you know we did provide a reparations uh, uh, benefit for or at least compensation, you know, for those who were affected by it. And so, uh, but to me, it's really saying, you know, history is personal. We all live in history, whether we sort of know it or not. And we make we make we make our choices. You know, do we what do we uh, give our time and energy to, and, and uh, uh, or not? And uh, what what would you say to somebody who says, "Well, Bob's family history is not my inheritance." You know, I I could say this: my ancestors weren't in the United States uh, during the period of slavery. Uh, my ancestors were Eastern European Jews, and they came here in the early 1900s right. um, when there was a big wave of immigration, uh, when a lot of people came came to the United States from Europe. And so 
did, they weren't even in the United States right. then. Like, so how, but, how is that, how does that, what, what would you did, say did, to the, to sure, the argument did, that uh, that's not my yeah. inheritance? Did they accept the United States when they got here? Well, they came here, I would think, for economic reasons, did, probably primarily, and to avoid but they religious became, persecution. But they became American. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so when you become American, you don't get to pick and choose what that means. Right. You know? And you know, a, a very concrete example is that the, the profitability of cotton production and slavery was a major factor in the development of, of the American uh, of capital formation in the antebellum in the United States for the country as a whole. It was probably the single most important contributor to capital formation in the United States mm -hmm. before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, so that everybody who lived in the United States was benefiting from the you know, uh, the buildup of that capital could provide for the kind of economic growth that you know that, that we were experiencing and so forth. So that the fact that you didn't necessarily you know you know found that didn't own a, a slave or what didn't uh, uh, operate a segregated uh, business, you know, it doesn't mean that you're not you know affected by it and benefiting from it uh, as an American. Uh, and indeed, the question of if, if you're an American, where do you want us to go forward is the same question. Right. So how do you, how do you address these things in, your, in the curriculum that, that your organization has put together? Yeah, I, you know, I, I take what I call the Jack Webb approach, if you remember the, uh, uh, the old Dragnet uh, TV show. Uh, uh, and when, when Jack Webb was out trying to solve a, a murder and he was interviewing somebody, he'd say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Yeah. And basically we start with the facts because that's something that we, that's, that's a given. And, you know, and, and uh, we have documentation, we have evidence to show what those facts were. So that it's, not, it's not a matter of, uh, of guesswork. And uh, because it seems, it seems to me that if you, if, if you start with the facts and really wrestle with the facts, um, you then are really dealing with, you know, you're not in denial. You know, you're trying to find out what you know what's what what's the truth here, um, and that allows individuals still to choose their own you know, what interpretation they would give, how they would answer the why questions. Uh, but that uh, it seems to me it's, that that's really the, the the important part is so that you then you know, look at that history and say, okay, what am I going to do about it in my own life? And it's really making history personal in a way that's not a matter of, of uh, you know, studying uh, famous people and events in the past uh, as a uh, something that's outside of me. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to give this a little bit of context, maybe we should back up and just say what what your organization actually does, right? And so, as I understand it, you've created a a curriculum that can be used um, at the high school level, correct? Right. Um, and and you sort of make that curriculum available to anybody who wants to use it. Is that correct? Right. And yeah. how how did the curriculum sort of come together? Did did you put it together? Or did you work with other people to put it together? Yeah, I started with a sort of master outline of what I thought you know, sort of the American history we all need to know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, with a you know a dozen or so topics and and. Uh, uh, found some graduate students who were willing to uh, to work uh, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, w wages I could afford, uh, an hourly rate better than what they generally would get as you know as, as on campus, but nevertheless uh, you know, at a, uh, a rate, I, rate I, I could afford. And we began uh, just developing the, the you know the, 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 the different topics and. Uh, and do you think that what you were putting together is something different than how history was being taught? Or I guess I guess you're, you're you're reacting to something. You're you're trying to fill some gap. So like, what what was the sort of what was your perception of what you were reacting against, or what the gap was that you were trying to fill? I, it was, as I said, it, I think it's really to try to make history personal, to make it about the, you know help kids understand the experience of people in the past and try to experience in a, in a, in a, in a, in a personal way. Uh, so that it was really to supplement and to put a different perspective on history that they would be learning as part of their, you know, standard curriculum. But to, 
uh, uh, but to challenge them to think about it a little, in a different way and to, to sort of own it personally and see where, what's the connection to, to me. And then, the, then all of our lessons end with a, the last day has a civic engagement uh, activity uh, so that it's, uh, you know, uh, how, how would I, uh, you know, what should be the elements of, a, of, a, of an urban policy that really is, uh, addresses the disparities and, and uh, uh, issues, you know, that, that are apparent in urban America in terms of uh, race and color and you know, economic class and so forth. Uh, and so just to give people some, some, some sense of what the curriculum covers, what are the what are the topics that, that your curriculum focuses on particularly? Yeah, we, we, have, we actually have, have nine high school topics, and one of the things I want to uh, chat about in a minute is, is we've expanded from that to other uh, uh, populations. And again, I, we started out with, you know, what do you, you know, do something in education? Well, you, what do you do in education? You develop a curriculum for a, for a classroom. Sure. Uh, so that's where we started. And so we have... Uh, uh, modules on the history of women, uh, uh, starting with uh, Seneca Falls in 1848 and coming down to coming down to the present, which is uh, includes a lot of uh, Supreme Court cases uh, on uh, women's rights. Uh, mostly, in terms of the number, show uh, how women were being excluded from, you know, uh, economic. You know, couldn't couldn't be a lawyer. Uh, couldn't vote, uh, couldn't uh, serve on a jury mm -hmm. uh, until uh, the 1960s when, uh, under, with equal protection uh, uh, approaches, uh, the, the law, you know, the, the law began to change. Um, uh, we have a, a module on the LGBTQ experience, uh, which again starts around the turn of the century and uh, comes, comes to the present, in which we have uh, really the centerpiece is looking at uh, a dozen different subtopics about uh, either famous uh, LGBTQ persons like uh, you know, Bayard Rustin, who was a, a leading architect of the March on Washington, Billie Jean King, um, but also uh, the uh, 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 Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals uh, from the American Psychiatric Association, which in 1952 classified uh, homosexuality as a uh, sociopathic personality disorder. Uh, and that was the official policy of the medical profession until uh, until the 1970s, when you know, when they began to change, and it's now mm -hmm. you know, been been, uh, been modernized. And uh, but understanding that it you know, that was you know again post World War II, so you know, recent history uh, certainly from my standpoint. Um, uh, we have a module on Cesar Chavez and the uh, effort to. Uh, uh, Developed the American Farm Workers Union, but really to bring dignity to uh, farm workers. Uh, we have a module on American apartheid. Uh, we call it because it deals with uh, segregation in housing and redlining. And you can look we uh, look at interactive maps that show how uh, uh, what you know, residential patterns over time and, and how redlining has really been you know, continues to shape American cities. Um, uh, we have two modules on the civil rights movement, one civil rights in the 30s and one, uh, uh, and one in, the, in, in the 60s, again, where we look at conditions of, uh, of African Americans and, and efforts to make change. I mean, you know, the, the high, the, really the centerpiece of the 1930s one is the meeting in the White House between A. Philip Randolph and President Roosevelt when Randolph was threatening to do a march on Washington in 1941. Uh, and uh, bring tens of thousands of African Americans to Washington to demonstrate against uh, Jim Crow and for fair treatment and defense industry hiring, uh, which Roosevelt did not want to have happen. Uh, and so with Ellen Roosevelt's help, he organized a meeting in the White House and uh, ended up adopting, uh, saying he would adopt an executive order, which was the uh, 8802, uh, which was the high point of civil rights activity in the Roosevelt administration, but it was a Mostly symbolic effort to say we need to be you know, fair in, in, in our hiring. I mean, uh, for example, uh, Boeing in Seattle uh, had a segregated workforce. And they said, oh, it was because the unions you know, are segregated mm -hmm. and we only hire you know, union workers. And so that's why we're segregated. But, but uh, uh, again, in the far, far northwest, uh, Boeing uh, aircraft company was you know was operating in a segregated way in, in 1940. 
Uh, and then we have a, the, the last module we up was on uh, health crises and health inequities, which we developed uh, in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, surprise, surprise, but it deals with uh, the polio, the uh, uh, flu pandemic in 1918, uh, polio, HIV, and then COVID, where we compare uh, the, uh, the, those pandemics, but also uh, you know how people were treated and how you know, and how uh, you know, uh, health inequities and, and, and to the extent that as there have been historical patterns of, of health inequities which have been uh, become apparent during uh, pandemics. And I think you say in the materials that 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 those modules are directed at eleventh graders, high school kids. Like what over the course of a school year, a typical school year. If if an eleventh grade high school student is in a history class right. that they're taking over the course of the school year, is is what you're doing sort of intended to be the full school year, or just a piece of it, or somehow integrated into some other broader it, curriculum, or how do you see it? Yeah, if a teacher wanted to use all of our materials, it would be about one semester. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. At this point, most schools really not geared. To, it would be an elective. It would be something in addition to. Uh, you know, eleventh grade is the uh, you know, certainly in California where uh, the second you know, the rest of U.S. history is taught. I mean, from roughly eighteen seventy six to the to the uh, to the present, uh, mm -hmm. and so that's why we sort of focused on that because to the extent that uh, existing classes want to integrate, take pieces of what of, of our materials and and use them uh, uh, in that curriculum, that's where you know that's where 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 it would fit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, with, with, with the current iteration. I developed, uh, we, we did a whole set, and then I uh, and it was in conversation with the LA uh, Unified School District, which is the second largest in the country, and where I had a, uh, began to develop a relationship with their curriculum coordinator uh, in 2015. And uh, they agreed that they would do a memorandum of understanding to have all our materials posted on their website for their teachers. And at that point, I said, let me, let's get the materials really. Uh, a one shape, and so I engaged two retired LA uh, school teachers, and we revised everything and made it, uh, you know, sort of, uh, from point, sort of suitable to work in a classroom. And so, because we had, you know, I, I came from a non classroom, right? About, I taught for three years, but that was a long time ago. And, yeah, so and that's about, that, that's sort of interesting. So, how, like, what did you learn from that experience about how classroom? curricula get adopted in the public in the public school system i mean that's sort of a mystery to me my kids went through yeah. public schools and they were taught things but i i actually have almost no visibility as a parent into like how those decisions get made about what is going to be taught yeah I, I, i'm mostly familiar with california just because that, the connections that i've made have yeah, been, sure. been, been, been in southern california so how did how did it work in well, la but there's a, a state adopted uh, history, social science uh, framework, and that's really the master guide for what needs to be taught in the classroom. It doesn't prescribe um, particular lesson plans, mm -hmm. but it provides the you know, sort of the uh, historical script for or the context for what 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 is appropriate to be taught, mm -hmm. uh, and which I found somewhat it, it is incredible because our first set of modules I had one on uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, as a, uh, uh, you know, really her as a, as a female leader, you know, the earliest of, you know, female leaders in, in, in the country. And uh, my LA teachers point out that she's actually not mentioned uh, in the, the framework. And so we couldn't have the teachers wouldn't use a module that was focused on Eleanor Roosevelt. And where, who developed the it, framework? It's, it's a, under the state education department, you know, a, you know, a committee. Yeah, people. You know, so, so we revised that module, and it actually was a, turned out to be a good thing because we revised the module really to focus on civil rights and the New Deal, which of course was, you know, fully covered by the framework, um, and allowed us to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt, but then to uh, uh, have her. So, some of her reactions, for example, the Marian Anderson concert at the Lincoln Memorial in 1938 is one of the episodes that we look at, and so there was us uh, both to look at Eleanor Roosevelt, but also Mar uh, Marian Anderson and 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 uh, the. Uh, uh, early as an African female African American leader in the uh, in, in in that time, right? Uh, so, it, at least at the high school level, it seems to me that teaching history is is an instrumental exercise in this. And what I mean by that is, you are teaching 
history to high school students in order to achieve some particular goal that you want to achieve with those particular students. It's not, it's not academic history. It's not independent research. It's not PhD level history. You are, you are conveying a certain narrative to the students that you want them to absorb for some instrumental purpose. I mean, maybe you disagree with that, but if you assume that that's true, what, what do you see as sort of the instrumental purpose of the curriculum that you put together? Or maybe I should start by saying, do you, do you agree with my, well, with, my, with my sort of perspective on, on sort of how history is taught at the high school level? I, I, I mean, all history, you know, wherever it's taught, has, you know, in a sense, is meant to, to uh, uh, you know, con 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 convey an understanding of, you know, of, you know why things happened in the past and, and sort of why we're the way we are now. Um, I, as I've tried to suggest, to me, the, the most important thing is be factual and you know, try to uh, understand the connection to mm -hmm. yourself and why with you know things are the way they are and how you can how you can make it better so that you end up with a uh, uh, you know how do I take this knowledge and you know go forward with it rather than you know having it be something I know for its own sake right but by picking the knowledge that you're imparting to the kids you are you are you know, I, you're, you're, you're at least nudging them in a particular direction, right? Because, because again, kind of going back to something I said earlier, it does seem to me that history, at least when you're talking about putting together a high school curriculum, that you are, you are largely engaged in a, in a selection process. There's a, there's a huge amount of history that could sure. be taught, yeah, no, right? Yeah. And you're, 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 you're making, you're kind of slicing and dicing that down to sort of like, here's the thing that I want the high school students to know. And to somewhat to the exclusion of other things, because there's only so much teaching time right. you get, right? right? You get an hour a day over the course of a semester or whatever, right? So there's not, you, you really have to boil it down to a few things that you want them to absorb. So, so you're largely engaged in this process of selecting the history that you want them to, te to, to know. And in making that selection process, aren't you doing it with some goal in mind that in other words, by presenting them with this particular history, you hope that the student then has a particular type of experience or takes something away from that that they're going to apply in the future, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it, what, what was your sort of thinking well, in putting together this curriculum yeah. in terms of kind of what the goal was? Go back and just, on the to topics of the modules, yeah. you know, women's history, you know, belief that you know, whether you're male or female, but understanding, yeah. you know, the uh, role of, of of gender in our history is pretty fundamental. Uh, and one of the articles that I uh, used as a as a guide was is called uh, "Why Diamonds Really Are a Girl's Best Friend," mm -hmm. uh, and it's written by well, actually a mentor of mine, Linda Kerber, but who also is one of the early leading feminist historians. Now retired at the University of Iowa, former president of the AHA. Um, and she reviews you know, the legal history of uh, American women in, in the Supreme Court, that, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, and she, the title of the article reflects the fact that in common law, the only property a woman actually could own outright as her own was her jewelry. Mm -hmm. and everything else that a married woman possessed belonged to her husband, including her body. It, to me, that's, that is a, a basic uh, piece of history that we all just need to understand. So, yeah, uh, I mean, it's an... It, it, it's and, an and the fact that change only came in 1970 with the, you know, re, you know Reed v. Reed case and equal protection. Uh, and so that, you know, if, if we feel, re, if we experience remnants of that prior history, mm -hmm. um, it's because it's pretty recent. Right. You know, Louisiana had the community had prop, property laws until the nineteen until it was struck down in nineteen eighty two, that continued to allow a man to, to have the dominant control of, of all marital property. So there's a lot of different ways that you can interpret that story, though, right? So the the story you're telling there is one of a, of a of a change in the perception of women's rights over time, and then a change in the legal structure that that followed that. And, you know, one, one version of that story could be, Hey, isn't it 
great that we've kind of overcome the sins of the past and we now live in a more equitable society. That could be one story you could tell. You could also tell a slightly different story, which is, well, we haven't overcome the sins of the past. And in fact, we're still, uh, we're still experiencing those effects. Um, a third story you might tell is, well, that was an interesting thing that happened in the past, but now we live in a, we live in a world where we've all sort of agreed that there should be uh, equality, and isn't it great that we don't have to fight about those things anymore? I mean, so there's still a lot of choices in, that you make in sort of how you tell the story. So how do, how do you go about making those choices? I, I, I don't exclude any of those possibilities. It yeah. seems to me that, that it's really not for me to, you know, provide conclusions for the, for the students. And so what we do in this module is to have the, the students read the cases and actually I use a, a briefing form, an outline form, to sort of pull the pieces of the, of the case out to understand which of the facts are, which facts are important and what, you know, what the law mm -hmm. applicable was. And then to do mock, mock appellate argument you know, on the two sides of that case and so that they really understand the, you know, sort of the dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, so when they get to the you know, re, the, you know, equal protection, they have an understanding of why things are the way they are now because that's the uh, uh, the dominant. But as we've just seen in the last you know, 48 hours mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, Texas uh, abortion law case, uh, that equal protection you know, isn't... Uh, yeah, it's still an ongoing it's issue. It's still an on ongoing yeah. process. So I guess the way you're describing that is, uh, again, I'm trying to sort of like abstract this out a little bit, uh, think about it at, at sort of a, a higher level of abstraction that you're, you sort of are taking history as a little bit of like a, uh, like a, a morality story. Like what you want the kids to come away with is this sort of, it's almost like a good versus evil story. And from that, you want them to be motivated to can to sort of like be on the right side of that story is that is that fair? I mean that's certainly a, a, you know and to the extent if you read from the, you know, our mission statement off the website I mean that's to the extent that we're saying we want to prepare young people to well, that, uh, fulfill the unprom you know, to fulfill the promise of America uh, uh, which goes to the uh, notions of equal rights and and uh, uh, justice and you know in our you know, uh, 1776 documents. Uh, sure, I mean that, and that's but it's it's to, uh, but the way to, to do that seems to me is to provide say this is where we've come from. These mm -hmm. are the facts. This this is what happened in the past. So this is you know uh, helps to f tell us you know, where we've come from, and exactly how you want to you know go forward is is for you to figure out for yourself. Uh, you know I do think that we you know we deal with you know hard history, things in our history that are not sort of pleasant chapters. Uh, the subtext of almost all of everything that we have is progress is made. Yeah, and that you know, and and indeed that the participants in that progress were very varied. You know that Marian Anderson, you know, as an African American opera singer, was able to make a real difference. You know, they Philip Randolph, uh, you know, leader of a small African American you know union of railroad workers confronted the President of the United States in 1941 and said, you know, we're going to, you know, challenge you to meet a higher standard. I mean, you're talking about chutzpah. Uh, that was, you know, it, it says a lot about, you know, where the civil rights movement was at, 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 at that time. And I think understanding that is, is, is important, you know, for us as persons and citizens and we decide, you know, where we want to, we want to go forward with it. Right, right. And sort of where does, where does sort of like the idea of there's sort of a counter narrative in American history, this sort of idea of the American dream and um, sort of extreme, in, extreme independence and um, almost this rejection of this idea of inherit, inheritance, that the American dream was that you could come from anywhere and regardless of where you had come from, you know, you got a fresh start and you were unbound from your inheritance and could just move forward in the way you wanted to move forward, right? That's sort of the, uh, you know, maybe a more, maybe that's now sort of an old-fashioned, but a more sort of traditional narrative of, of American history. Like, how, how do you see that narrative playing out now in, or, or 
or, or, or do you? It's funny. I haven't quite thought of it sort of in that particular way. I mean, I, I, and we actually have one of the things that we did when we expanded you know, in 2020, uh, we added what I call the multimedia uh, resource uh, for each of the of the modules, and we included in each of those a range of materials that really were sort of didn't fit in the school printing because we can't have classrooms burdened with a requirement of more yeah. materials than they can really manage right. in, the, in the time frame. So the multimedia supplements really allow us to provide a range of materials that are on the topic, but that um, go beyond what's in the school curriculum and, and in many ways so, uh, allow us to show more nuance and depth and, and other things. And so that that uh, I think that the uh, that the narr that the narrative of of you know of you know American success is uh, largely a you know white immigrant story uh, that the rules that that apply and you know, and not uniformly even among you know, I mean, uh, over time it you know the differences have you know have been less less significant but nevertheless you know the struggles of Immigrant groups arriving and, 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 and making their way in this country has been uh, has not always been easy, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a module immigration where we can look at those uh, the stories in the 1880s and then the the night that after 2000 in terms of what the immigrant experience is a, is actually like. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that the narrative you suggest is has basis, but it's it, it's a uh, it's a bit of fiction, and indeed I would would. Uh, throw out a thought I've had in, in, in the last couple of weeks is that, you know, it's that thought that of American exceptionalism that got us into Afghanistan on a 20 year war. Uh, and the idea that we can, you know, make, a, you know, a country in, you know, in East Asia, uh, you know, like the United States, uh, really comes from this notion that somehow. Uh, what we, you know, what, who we are and what we've come from is is uh, uh, sort of special in history, and you know, and, and that we, if we just, you know, if if other people just, you know, will see it, they will, you know, can be transformed and be like us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know, it, to me, it's it's a, a, and there's an arrogance there that I, you know, that it is. Uh, well, we're still, you know, we're, we're suffering the consequences of that uh, as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a lot of talk in the news lately about uh, what people call critical race theory and whether critical race theory should be a part of school curriculum. Is that something that you've uh, had to deal with or have thought about in putting together your curriculum? It, it, in several ways. It's, it's, uh, I mean, one is that I'm, it, it, I've been working with uh, uh, two schools in Chattanooga on our after school program. and. Uh, one of the schools is a public charter school in Chattanooga, and uh, uh, they've indicated that there are topics that they won't be able to go into because of the local rules about uh, really flowing from critical race theory. Uh, and what are what are the forbidden topics? Well, it deals it deals with with explicitly with uh, uh, you know history of civil rights and. and black white relations and they just are, is it that broad in other words they've said you're not allowed to teach the history of the they're civil just, rights movement they're just concerned that if they you know if they go into those topics that they will get you know that parents will react and it'll become controversial and they'll get you know, get caught up in the uh, so I guess the, I guess this kind of goes back to something we touched on early on, which was maybe sort of regional divides within our country. So you've said you, you've had some positive reception to what you've been doing out in California. You know, I think we, most people would view that as a more liberal, liberal, progressive part of the the country. Have you have you tried to sort of shop this curriculum in other parts of the country? And what 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 do you expect to to hear? Well, I well, I, I, I yes, I'm, I'm trying to make contacts, you know, sort of all over. And yeah. I, I'm, uh, I guess, realistically think, focusing on uh, private schools in the South, particularly because they don't have the same uh, political context in which they operate. I mean, not that they are free of politics, but it's a different, you know, different, more, you know, localized politics. Well, I mean, you know, the mm -hmm. nature of the private school. Uh, uh, Community rather than the you know, larger uh, political community. Um, 
I, I, it's you know, it's a, t a moment when we're caught up in you know, history's been caught up in politics, and I think it's really unfortunate because objectively, the topics that you know have been associated with the critical race theory are by and large just the fact of our history. If you go back to I mean, my sort of substantive response is the Nyman quote that I started with: "We all have inheritances." Uh, you know, to the extent that there are parents who are concerned that the teaching of you know, hard history involving race relations uh, uh, is somehow making, try, trying to make their kids you know, feel guilty. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, that's not inherent in history. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm reminded of a, uh, of, of, a, of a statement to James Baldwin, who I think is one of the you know, really great uh, uh, thinkers of the last uh, of our, in our history. Uh, who, who, said, who said this in 1963, uh, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means you have agreed that human life is an academic matter, so I'm forced to be an optimist. What white people have to do is to try and find in their own hearts why it was necessary to have a N-word in the first place. Because I'm not an N-word. I'm a man, but if you think I'm an N-word, it means that you need him. The question you've got to ask yourself, the white population of this country has to ask itself, north and south, because it's one country, is, you know, if I'm not the N-word here and you invented him, why did you, why did you invent him? And, what's, and the future of the country depends on how we answer that. And it it does seem that the 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 debate about history curriculum is very tied to politics, and I and I think my sense is that it's for exactly kind of what you're hinting at there, which is that the narratives we tell about our history are particularly the history we teach to our kids, right? Which again is very different than I think academic history, but the history that we teach to our kids is reflects what we want the, to think of ourselves as a society, right? Because we want, the, we want our children to kind of have those same views and to take those views forward into the future. And so that, that narrative that we teach our children about the history of our country really does, is, is a reflection of our view of that, right? It, it's sort of almost inevitable because again, going back to this point, there's an infinite amount of history you could choose from. We're going to pick a particular view of that, a particular slice of that history, and we're going to tell our kids that this is the important part. And those choices, it seems to me, are kind of inevitably tied to political issues, particularly in a country like ours that is just so diverse, that doesn't really have a unified history necessarily. Yeah. It's so big. So much has happened. People have come from so many different places that this like fight about the historical narrative is almost, it's almost like the fight about the flag. It's like, what are we going to unify around? And can, can we find a narrative? Is it possible in the United States to find a historical narrative that everyone can unify around? I mean, yeah. what do you think well, about that? Well, that, that, that's interesting. That's one of the things that I was, uh, did want to talk, want, yeah. want to talk about. Because it, uh, it, to me, our history is really we boil down to diversity and division. If you look at our history, we have been most we have been one of the most diverse societies on the face of the earth since our founding. Because in, you know, in 1619, yeah. when the first Africans were brought here, there already were Native Americans here, yeah. and in European terms, there were a lot of different you know Europeans, and so that they were uh, you know uh, who thought of themselves as Spaniards and English and so forth, and, and uh, so that in that sense, we were very diverse from the very beginning, but we're also very divided because the English colonists you know uh, subjugated the, Af the Native Americans and, and and brought Africans as as, uh, as enslaved people. Uh, and so there was a you know a built a built in uh, a division, and as I thought about the times that we have been able to really to unify has been during war. Mm -hmm. The American Revolution uh, brought you know the colonists together around a particular goal, and as it turned out in the Declaration of Independence, set of ideas. Uh, those ideas didn't last to the Constitution, because by the time you get to the Constitution, the 
uh, uh, ideas of, of equality and 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 in the in the dec declaration, uh, you know, are modified, shall we say, uh, to accommodate a slave system, so that you end up with the three fifths clause and etc. Uh, when's the next time we're unified? Is in the Civil War, and you take you know Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as the sort of uh, quintessential statement of what the goal of that war was, at least from the Northern perspective, uh, and there was momentary unity uh, around that. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed, which was historically very significant. Uh, but after 1876, our, both, you know, our, our history takes a very different direction. And again, the, you know, in terms of Jim Crow in the South was not only uh, was you know was tolerated indeed by the time you get to Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court is you know is blessing it for the country as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, World War One, you know, the world to make the world safe for democracy really does is an international vision. And so, but there was again like a momentary you know sort of unity around that. Uh, and then you get to the World War Two and the Cold War, where the fight against Nazi uh, racism. Uh, and totalitarianism is but sort of a unifying idea coming out of the uh, uh, Second World War. It does provide a basis for the kind of for the equal protection. It's kind of a depressing view of the world, though. Like we have to we have to go to war <laughs> to, uh, to 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 find some yeah, sort of unity. I, 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 I really just, just in preparing to, to chat with you, yeah, I yeah. really I had that thought. And, yeah. But if you think about it, because you know, otherwise we've been. You know, been very divided. One of the last uh, sets of material was a, a, a multimedia resource uh, that I call America Divided. You know, and, and it's really the history of, of extremism and democracy, and you know the kinds of uh, views and and uh, differences that we're seeing now and that were you know on display in, in January sixth have a long history. And you can go back into the sure. you, know, in, in, you know, and they were you know into the to the to the early sixties. And, uh, and you're, when you say January sixth, you're talking about the Capitol riots, right? The, ins yeah. the insurrection at the Capitol, yeah. and you know, and the uh, and, you know views of those who were participating in that. And so it's it's really not you know the you know immediate past president helped to crystallize some of that thing, but it long antedated him and is certainly outliving him as a, as a political figure. And, and it's, and that's a very much, you know, you know, part of, part of our history that, um, you know, well, so, so do you, do you see this sort of curriculum development process as one that attempts to find a unifying narrative or is it just that you have to pick sides and you have to fight the fight? I, well, I wouldn't put it quite in either of either. I mean, yeah, I come back to the idea that we all have inheritances, uh, and that if we each have a, you know, a responsibility to, you know, look at our past honestly, and so that we accept the, you know, all the good and the bad, which includes, you know, the John Birch Society, or including, you know, not that we have to agree with, it, but we we recognize that that's part of where of who we are and where we've come from. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of country do we want for our kids and our grandkids? And mm -hmm. what can I do to try to try to you know make that better? And we're and you know, we're not going to agree on that, but it seems to me at least that as a goal and a purpose, that's the right question to ask. And it frames in the way to try to you know if you will go to our better angels rather than to uh, you know, in a different direction. One of the professors I had at Stanford, a guy named David Potter, was an eminent American historian, and, and he taught the pre-Civil War period. And one of the, the uh, lessons I learned from that was that we, we all have a bunch of things we value. If we, and we could, you know, listen, we could listen, most of us would agree upon things that are important in terms of, of uh, political freedom, in terms of you know, protecting our families, in terms of uh, economic opportunity, et cetera. Uh, but the priority and the hierarchy of those values varies over time. And indeed, our political leadership often plays, or our cultural leadership plays an important role in uh, how those values are prioritized. You know, and you know, one of the things he points out in the 1850s is that a lot of values that had held the North and the South together began to unravel. Uh, and I think that we're in that, that period now, and, and I do think that there's a, 
a leadership uh, dearth in the country today to really bring us to, to, to together on the values that we that we share, uh, and that the you know, that the political dynamic in the country now really is about you know, deepening the divisions and using the divisions for political advantage. Yeah. Uh, in a way that I think is, if you look at the, you know, step back and look at the country whole, oh, I think is objectively, uh, you know, not where we really want the country to be, but it's a dynamic that, that's certainly alive and and strength has yeah. strength. Yeah. Well, I think as is always true, uh, discussions about history end up being discussions about a lot of other things too, right? They end up being discussions about morality and politics and uh, and a lot of other interesting things. But let me let me just kind of take this back to some nuts and bolts issues. So, um, own your history is. Uh, you know, underneath that, you have a 501c3 nonprofit. Right. Is that correct? Right. Um, and that's the Reconciliation Education Project is the name of that nonprofit. Right. So, what what do you hope to do with that that organization going forward? Do you have a sort of a roadmap for where you're going from here? We set that up early on because it seemed that we needed a a you know a legal entity to you know hopefully raise money, but at least to to be the umbrella for what we're doing. And and indeed, uh, with the help of uh, 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 John Gibson Dunlardy, whose name is escaping me right now, we actually applied for and got one of the first 51C3 approvals uh, under the new simplified rules. So we applied on on July 1st, 2014, and had our uh, approval on July 13th. Uh, but it seemed to me that we really did to just to do significant fundraising. We needed more than a nice name. Uh, on the door, that we needed to really have a program that had content and it had, you know, it's some, uh, you know, had credibility and outside validation. And so we have really been trying to develop the substance of the program as our sort of primary, uh, primary mission. Uh, as I think I mentioned, we, uh, in 2019, we went into an agreement with the LA School District and they were going to, and they have posted all our materials uh, on their teacher website as proved materials, and we have a similar agreement with the San Bernardino City uh, School District in, in, in Southern California, which is like the fifth largest in the state. Um, unfortunately, that happened just before the pandemic threw monkey wrenches into every aspect of American education. Yeah. Uh, and so the trying to get new materials uh, you know, adopted and in use is just really, you know, almost seemed like a fool's errand. Yeah. Um, but what we have done parallel to that, as I say, we've developed these multimedia uh, resources, which is a way of, of, of deepening, but also you, a, a book club could use one of our multimedia resources as a text for, uh, instead of a, you know, a novel, because we have a lot of interesting materials there that, that, that lend themselves to, uh, to, to discussion. Uh, in 2015, a Gibson Dunn partner that I met with, uh, who had just been involved in reorganizing a set of boys and girls clubs in LA, uh, said, you know, it'd really be great to get own your history uh, into boys and girls clubs. You know, that kind of substantive uh, personal development materials would be something that I think would be really good. And so he connected me with that, and so we developed an after school program. Um, that had been used in half a dozen clubs in uh, Southern California in the Bay Area uh, before the pandemic. And then again, they, they were, uh, and I was reaching out to other clubs in, in, in the beginning of 2020. And again, their, their, their whole program and their economics uh, uh, was uh, turned on its ear at that time. We're now you know, hoping to be able to, to restart that. But we have a, an after school program that allows us to. Uh, provide the substance of owner history, you know, less sort of history content and more uh, uh, we all have inheritances and what are we going to do about them uh, uh, in an after school context. And so it's meant to be more fun, uh, more approach, but also lower barriers to entry because they can be used in any kind of an after school program. And so one of the things that, that happened in the beginning of this year, which has been very exciting, was these two schools in Chattanooga uh, did a joint program to use those materials. And one of the schools is a, it's actually the white boarding school, you know, predominantly white boarding school uh, that I went to. Uh, it's now desegregated, but it's still, you know, 90% uh, white students. Mm -hmm. uh, working with a Chattanooga charter school that is 90% minority. And so they put together a, a, a group of kids 
uh, half from each school uh, who didn't know each other. I mean, the kids from two schools had not met before, and they did our after-school program for six uh, evenings uh, this winter. Uh, and they said it was just transforming, and that the, the, the uh, principal of the two schools who commented on it said it was uh, that it, it, uh, it really they were trying to develop leaders for Chattanooga for the future, and this program was really an important step oh, in moving great. in that direction. And uh, uh, and so we've seen there an opportunity to do what I call community building, which is to have a program where you uh, can bring diverse groups of people together and have them use our materials, which have a uh, an objective basis, so that it's not like uh, sort of personal confrontation was trying to say, you know, what are some things we have in common in terms of, of our growing up experiences, our aspirations for ourselves and for our communities, uh, and how can we find common ground? Uh, and uh, so we've developed, we're actually finishing up a handbook now for this community development program so that uh, uh, we again, really can make it available to, to anybody. I mean, again, it can be a church group, an adult you know, book club, and uh, adult group, whatever whatever group wants to come together, this is provide a roadmap for them to be able to have a, uh, you know, whether it's three weeks or six weeks or longer, period of interaction where they can try to, you know, find some common ground. So if somebody listening to this wants to do that, where can they get some information? Where can they get your materials? Ah. How do they learn more? Yeah, go to our website, which is uh, www. Uh, ownyourhistory.us and all our materials are free. We, we there's a we have they're covered by Creative Commons uh, licensing, which so there's a framework for uh, their usage. But uh, allowed we're very flexible in allowing uh, anybody to use our materials without without charge, uh, to modify them in ways that you know, that that they want to without having to worry about you know copyright issues or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, all right. Well, that's that, that's fantastic. So, I mean, we're both lawyers, and you know, uh, I suspect most of the people that are going to listen to this podcast have some connection to the law world as well. Have you have you thought at all about sort of the intersection of this narrative of American history with how we practice law? And I guess what I mean by that is, would you would you would you advise sort of a, a new lawyer? Um, thinking about their career path to sort of view that through the lens of this historical narrative and how, how would they do that? I mean, as, you, as we both point out, you know, we both were history majors, and so to that extent, it, in some sense, we were, you know, we were thinking of yeah. that as a useful way of, of leading us on, on the path that we ended up by, ended up by taking. Um, you know, we've included a lot of legal uh, history uh, in the own your history materials, I think in part because uh, you know, we are a society uh, shaped by law in so many ways, uh, and that I think that it's you know, that the two are you know, are sort of intertwined. Whether we you know, you know it's, it's a given. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in the 17th century, when you know slavery was first being uh, developed in Virginia, the Virginia legislature started passing laws and regulating you know how, how you know how slavery would be would operate. Right. Uh, right. Well, and 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 I mean, you you had a history working in in finance issues, which are obviously tied up yeah. with. I mean, you write about in your I mean, curriculum I, about redlining and things that went on in the in the finance industry. And I mean, one of the one of the great things I'd say about being a lawyer in Washington D.C. is you always feel like you're you know only yeah. one step removed from kind of history in action. Um, and I, I I I think sort of one of the really one of the sort of joys of, of being a lawyer, um, particularly in Washington, D.C., I think, is that you do kind of feel a little bit of that, maybe it's what you call that inheritance. You sort of feel that history kind of behind you and pushing you forward, even in just kind of doing your day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day things that you do for clients, you know, because we're right here, we're dealing with these judges and these courts. And uh, and often we, we we know the lawyers that are on the front lines of these various yeah. various hot hot topic issues. I know when I was at Gibson Dunn, I mean that 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 law firm routinely represented uh, parties in in very important Supreme Court cases and um, you know stuff like that. So I think uh, for people who are interested in law, interested in history, and feel motivated by that. Um, 
law really is a great sort of career choice, particularly I think the way law is practiced in the United States. I mean, we are, we're a common law system. It's a very history based legal system, right? Yeah. Like we don't just, we don't just assume, I think in some countries there's sort of an assumption that the law is just whatever the person in charge says it is that day. But that's not the assumption in the United States. The assumption in the United States is that the law is this thing that has developed very gradually over time and that you can't just start fresh. Like you have to build on what was there before, you know, and that change is gradual and that that is like a historical process. At least that's how I perceive it. I think it. that's right. Although I, although I th do think that in the last year, particularly, we we are being challenged in terms of how we think about that. Yeah. And that, that legislators have, have adopted laws that uh, it seems to me are, are uh, one-sided in a way that we don't, you know, don't, I actually don't don't yeah. find it you know as big right in terms of vote. You know the. You know, from voting and and now the the you know the abortion law from Texas and that, that those are, um, you know, uh, and certainly you know Jim Crow was a function of American oh, law. I, I certainly and don't so, mean and, to suggest no, no, that, no, that, no, that law is a it moves it no, uniformly in no, one direction. That, but, but I'm just saying that it is it is when we talk about legal issues in the United States, I think we almost always talk about them in no, a historical context. Yeah, I, I just really actually think that we, we talk a lot about the rule of law and yeah. the importance of the rule of law, and yes, it is because the Senate is not. Uh, as you say, some autocrat dictating uh, the rules. Uh, the rule of law is certainly our tradition and, you know, and superior to that, but that the rule of law, uh, if to the extent that it's enacted by a, you know, a legislature mm -hmm. uh, through a political process, you know, is going to reflect the, you know, the values and process dominant at that time and, uh, you know, uh, objectively may not be uh, the best laws for, the, for everyone in the society that there are, you know, you know the winners and losers are, uh, yeah. you know, uh, 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 more obvious in, in some cases than, you know, than, than others. But the debate, but the debate, even if you don't like the outcomes, the debates around those laws are almost always framed in historical uh historical yeah. ways of thinking, I think, yeah, I mean, because they're often a debate about like what, what actually happened in the past. That's usually, yeah. there's some debate about facts, you know, what happened in the last election, right? There's a, there's, there's a debate going on right now about very recent history, exactly. right? No, I, like uh, that really the last two elections really, I think we're, we're subject to very intense debate about what actually happened in the election. Yeah. And then w the conclusions that people reach about that then push them in various political directions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do think that the that having historic perspective is useful to the extent that lawyers are gonna very be very much engaged in that yeah. that process you know, where where those issues are be, are being hashed out because I do think that that uh, keeping in mind that you know history is watching is not a bad you know, way of, yeah. of of having keeping perspective. Yeah. And you know, and I think the fact that that uh, uh, some bar associations are now beginning to respond to uh, uh, the lawyering that went on in terms of the challenging of the 2020 elections. You know, again, is reflecting the fact that we have a a, a culture that values uh, certain kinds of, of, of standards and professionalism, and that uh, that those those you know those those are worth enforcing, reminding right. pr practitioners that yeah you know those yeah. they, those those rules matter. That's a really excellent point, and I think the 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 legal institutions we have in the United States have for the most part kind of held, right? In other words, we haven't seen sort of a crumbling of the basic institutions yeah. yet. I mean, there's always the possibility that that, that that could happen, but that those legal institutions tend to have a moderating effect. In other words, at the extremes, when things get too out of whack, I mean, you know, we see this even, you know, it's, it's happening even now. You'll, you'll yeah. have extreme laws passed by state legislatures or laws that are seen as extreme but that's not the end of the story, right? Then there's a bunch of legal challenges to those laws. There's a lot of lobbying that goes on. And, and over time, you know, in general, things tend to moderate back towards the middle. You know, at least that's no, my perception. Yeah, yeah no, and I, and, and I do think that, 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 that uh, a number of individual lawyers who are holding uh, public uh, uh, office, I mean, who are in the Justice Department or in, a, you know, in the in state government, yeah. uh, you know, 
uh, their legal training, I think, very much contributed to the fact that they did the right thing. That they that they you know that they did maintain the uh, you know the, the rule of law system and you know and democracy uh, when they were being called on not to. Yeah, uh, and right. I think that, that both law and history were part of uh, the uh, process and decision making by those individuals, and I think that you know it does reflect the strength of our training in our institutions that. Um, even though they may have had personal views that were one side of the political spectrum or the other, uh, that that didn't uh, overcome their their, uh, their their legal training and their values and right. what they what was important as, right. as a lawyer. Most lawyers still are institutionalists at some basic level, right? They will still sort of stand up for the institution. You know, I think. Um, well, okay, this has just been a really, really fascinating yeah, I, conversation. <laughs> uh, we usually like to end with something kind of a little more lighthearted because uh, often the conversations are pretty pretty heavy and, and, and deep. Um, and so let me just ask you this. You, you've probably worked with a lot of different people in putting together these materials and, and working on, on Own Your History. Um, any sort of like interesting, fun anecdotes or interesting characters you've, you've come yeah, across? I, I've really enjoyed I mean, I'm, look, I'm 75. Uh, so I started this in my late 60s. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed is, I've got, is that I've worked with a lot of graduate students. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, because their rates are uh, they're smart and, and their rates are what I can afford, and, <laughs> and uh, they do good work and have been really instrumental in in, uh, in our ability to put together the program that, that we have. Uh, but that's been great for me because even my my youngest uh, uh, child is now over thirty, and so I mean that it, it, working directly with. Uh, you know, early twenty somethings is, uh, is 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 fun and helps. And one of the things that I've been uh, looking to, to try to get started is, is uh, uh, some social media. And uh, I've got a group of, of uh, four uh, uh, history graduate students uh, who are uh, who are trying to develop. You know, we've actually developed a Facebook page, and and uh, 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 want to try to figure out how we can we can use Twitter. And I, again, I felt like having you know twenty somethings was the only way to the, the only way to do it. Absolutely, um, you, need, you need young people if you're going to uh, live on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that's been is one particular uh, uh, colleague that I've I actually I've just written a uh, recommendation. To, uh, to law school for him, uh, but I met him in, in, in uh, uh, 2017. We were accepted as a client by a group program called Net Impact at UCLA, which is an extracurricular activity, but they basically do sort of business consulting uh, services, and, and uh, so I, there were a group of eight UCLA undergraduates that took Own Your History on as a project uh, during during that year, and the, their leader was a kid who was in his first year, uh, uh, really his first semester uh, at UCLA as the leader of this group, and I got to know him, and, and uh, uh, at the end of that year engaged him as our, uh, to, to run our tech uh, uh, work. Uh, terrific young man. I mean, just really been a joy to work with him, and and uh, and so when he asked me to uh, back going to law school and then uh, uh, helping his application, he was really one of those you know, things that I most gratified to do because he's just a, a really outstanding young man. I think he's going to be a he wants to be a tech lawyer. He's, he's actually working for the um, diversity and inclusion dig, digital inclusion project. Uh, uh, he's taking a year off before he, before he goes to law school. Uh, but that's been a real joy, and I, I, I say I wouldn't have been able to have that opportunity without uh, without doing on your history. Are you uh, are you looking for other volunteers? <laughs> yeah, I'm always looking for. I'm always looking for, because because you know students have a you know, career path, and and sure. uh, they, you know it. it uh, uh, our work only fits for a certain period of time. Like I have a one of my great supporters uh, is working on her PhD at uh, UC Irvine, and she just doesn't have. She's working on her dissertation. She just really didn't have time to. To, uh, to do much more than, than offer me comments from time to time. And so I, uh, I need to uh, find somebody. Who can All right. Well, if anybody listening to this is a, is a history major or, a, or a, a history grad student or maybe a, maybe a future lawyer, reach out to Bob Eager at uh, ownyourhistory.us and uh, tell him you, you want to well, help him with this what, project. What, what, one other <laughs> pitch I'd make here at the end is that institutionally, you know, Own Your History really needs a, a partner institution to go forward and I could try to raise money to hire a, you know, a, a staff. 
Uh, that's a sort of a daunting prospect, and so what I'm really looking for is something, I mean, a historical society, like a state historical society, or a museum, or a library, or an academic institution, uh, who would love to add a unique uh, education program uh, to their uh, to what they do, and uh, I would love to be able to find a partner like that so that we can get the benefit of their institutional uh, uh, strength, uh, but and also as 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 we uh, as we try to expand and go forward. Well, fantastic, and I, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. This and, has been terrific, and thank you for your time today. Enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Garrulous Gavel. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can always find us at garrulousgavel.com. If you'd like to send feedback or suggest a guest, please contact us at our email address, garrulousgavel at gmail.com, or on Twitter at garrulousgavel. Our cover art was created by artist and illustrator extraordinaire Joan Tico. Our theme music was written and performed by scientist and saxophonist extraordinaire Robert Tico. And our producer is the inimitable K.O. Myers of Particulate Media. See you next episode.